In today's video, we have all kinds of news and rumors to discuss, including the latest offseason trade talk focusing on teams like the Penguins, the Senators, and the Hurricanes. Could Jesperi Kakaniemi find himself either traded or bought out next season? We'll discuss those possibilities. Plus, we have big news on the Arizona Coyotes. We're going to talk a little bit further about their uh, plans for a new arena and how some news came together last night to take things in a positive direction. Plus, we know all the Masterton Trophy nominees for all 32 NHL teams. We're going to discuss the more prominent names that I feel actually have a better chance to win. And plus, we have lots of other updates, including some injuries and recalls from around the league. All that coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a lot to cover here today. Let's start with the news of the Bill Masterton Trophy nomination. So, of course, all 32 teams start with a nominee for the Masterton Trophy, which is, of course, for perseverance and dedication to hockey. Quite often, the winners of this award, depending on you know the stories of each player from year to year, quite often is a player who might have had to overcome significant injuries or a lot of off-season adversity to get back and play and you know kind of show their dedication to the sport and overcome a lot to, to get back with their team and, and hopefully have a successful run in the NHL again so that's not the only reason people win but it's certainly one of the more common ones for sure obviously if you're persevering and you're dedicated to the sport you know there's lots of players that uh, can kind of technically fall into those terms some teams sometimes struggle with their nominees because clearly they don't necessarily have a great story every single year and of course local media votes on uh, who the nominee should be for each team so some of the more prominent names out there you'll see include a good great story in calgary calgary flames nominee oliver shillington of course he was out of action for an extended period of time uh, obviously overcame a lot to get back uh, he'll certainly almost definitely be one of the finalists uh new flyers captain sean couturier is a the Flyers nominee, I would suspect he'll likely be a finalist as well. Uh, missed an extended period of time dealing with back issues. Had to overcome a lot and uh, to make it back this year and be able to play was, uh, you know, a huge, uh, you know, thing for him and the team. So Couturier definitely deserves a lot of props for all the hard work, determination, and perseverance he showed to get back. Uh, you know, Yoel Armia in Montreal, he might get a few votes as well. I'm not sure he'll be a finalist, but he'll certainly get – uh, some attention, of course, Armia certainly overcame a lot of adversity, including being uh, put on waivers, going to the minors, and it certainly made a lot stronger second half of his season. Um, Coyotes goaltender Connor Ingram is the Coyotes nominee. Uh, Connor's overcome a lot uh, as well. Uh, he's finally got himself into a more solid role with the Coyotes. Um, you know, he's uh, gone off through a lot off the ice, so I, I, I do like his story. Uh, Kane's goaltender Freddie Anderson as well missed an extended period of time this year dealing with a blood clot issue. Uh, Freddie's had to overcome a lot, and that certainly shows a lot of dedication and perseverance uh, to the sport. So uh, I think Freddie Anderson's got a, a great chance as well of being a finalist in Colorado. The nominee there is Jonathan Duran. Uh, another great story. Certainly had his fair share of struggles uh, during an extended run with the Montreal Canadiens, including uh, leaves from the team to deal with. Uh, mental health issues and things like that he was pretty open about some of his struggles there during his time in montreal and uh, certainly after his contract expired uh, was able to go reset in colorado get back on track uh, become a regular in the lineup a key contributor uh, with his old uh, junior linemate nathan mckinnon so duran's another great story of uh, kind of overcoming a lot of stuff he had to go through in montreal get himself back on track in colorado this year in minnesota marco rossi's another great story of course he's missed a ton of time uh, he dealt with a, a covid infection that seemed to drag on in like a, like a form of long covid for a long long stretch as well um so you know obviously this is his kind of breakout year so rossi certainly has gone through a lot off the ice and has you know put in a lot of time and effort uh, we have a couple of veterans and uh, crosby with pittsburgh Giroux with ottawa um i'm not sure they have a great story necessarily this year just the fact that they are extremely dedicated to their sport and they continue to persevere and put up great numbers at an older age i don't think they'll have a chance to be a finalist but within their respective groups uh they were recognized um, and said deserve um you know a lot of love and everything for everything they do for the sport 
I'm not sure they're going to really have a shot at being a finalist. Same goes for Jonathan Quick with the New York Rangers. Of course, he overcame, uh, you know, bouncing around a lot in the NHL last year, finalized in Vegas to have a Stanley Cup run. Of course, he didn't really have a big part in it, but got to be on the Golden Knights uh, Cup uh, run for sure. Uh, bounces back big time this year. Uh, played a big role in the New York Rangers, so he certainly persevered and dedicated and got his career back on track after uh, a lot of people thought it might be coming to a close. So, uh, again, I'm not sure his story is strong enough to become a finalist, but certainly deserves recognition. Uh, Nathan Walker in St. Louis as well, born in Australia. Or actually, no, I think, think he was. he's not actually born in Australia. I believe he was born in England. Moved to Australia as a little kid. Um, you know, he certainly had to overcome a lot just to get to the NHL because of the uh, just where he lived, not as many opportunities hockey-wise as there is in North America. Uh, Ilya Samsonov in Toronto is their nominee. Again, he's gone through a lot off the ice this year. Uh, pretty good story, but again, maybe not as strong of a case as some of the other guys like Shillington and Couturier, Anderson, etc. Uh, TJ Oshie in Washington, he's been through a lot. Uh, Winnipeg Jets goalie, uh, Laurent Brassois. Uh, another one, Noah Juleson in Vancouver. They've all overcome some serious injuries as well so lots of great stories i didn't personally realize until i read through all the 32 nominees just realizing just how many uh, good stories there are this year of people that have really put in that strong effort dedication perseverance to really get into this award i mean obviously every year there's usually a, you know a handful of good stories sometimes more than others but there really is a lot this year of people that you know they're not all going to be finalists for sure clearly uh it can only be one winner but at the end of the day, a lot of these people do deserve to be recognized for their strong efforts to get their careers back on track or to uh, to continue their careers and the longevity that they've been able to put in. So nice to see all these people be recognized. As I mentioned as well, the big news that came late last night, which there is a dedicated video on the channel, uh, was that the news about the Arizona Coyotes arena situation. So, of course, there was multiple pieces of Coyotes news yesterday, um, which kind of, some were not so positive, but the last one was the most positive, and it really, really wasn't a huge update per se. Um, it was in a sense because of all the other stuff we kind of put together uh, as far as the whole day's worth of news. But the positive news that came is that the land auction was finally posted because one of the other reports we had seen yesterday was that, um, and they were from a very reputable sports, ArizonaSports.com, uh, one of the radio broadcasters there who does have good intel, uh, said that he's heard reports that owner Alex Marullo has had multiple conversations about selling the team. Some uh, people he's talked to have been in the state. Some are outside the state. Not really clear what direction they're going in, but it sounds like there's a lot of you know, contingency plans in case they don't get this auction. At that point, they said that the, uh, the, the auction itself wasn't even guaranteed to be up this summer uh, based on how their rules work with the local governments and everything and state government. They didn't technically have to put the auction up until November. Uh, it could have taken that long, and it really where it hadn't been posted yet, it really wasn't clear when that was going to happen. Then, of course, later last night, the auction did get posted. It has to be posted for 10 weeks. So the actual auction date is June 27th. So that is the day that they show up. It's, in, it's an in-person auction. They have to show up with a check, a cashier's check. I believe it's... Um, and it's for a big chunk of money just to participate. It's expected. I believe the starting point of the land is around $68 million, if I'm not mistaken, on that number. Either way, if anybody else wants to bid against the Coyotes owners, they have to come in and they'll be there in person. So it's not like they're not going to know. It's a different scenario than the, uh, the Tempe vote, where there was a referendum. People are all going individually voting. You really don't know how those votes are going to turn out, right? You might get a feel for it one way or another, but there's nothing you can kind of look at and be like, oh, okay, I can see how this is going. Whereas this, if somebody actually has to physically show up, it's, you know, you're going to be raising your hand or raising a paddle every time you place a bid. I believe the, the bidding process is an increment of $100,000. Uh, there are some speculation, though, from one of the, the same uh, reports that we've seen um, from the... Uh, saying that there, there's talks of maybe selling, that there are other interest, interested bidders in this land. Uh, there's also some talk that this land, obviously we know, needs a ton of stuff to, because there's no infrastructure. It's just completely bare and empty. So at the earliest you would see a Coyotes game be played in this new arena, if it all works out, would be in the fall of 2027. 
And that's if everything goes perfect. And we know during construction, that's usually almost never the case. It could be later. It could be halfway through the 27-28 season. It could be into 2028. Will the NHL be willing to wait that long? I mean, the NHL, I think, would have known this, though, for some time. If they had big issues with it, you think we probably would have heard something by now. But at the end of the day, after getting the negative news about, you know, that this, this auction could be a lot later than we thought, the owner might be having conversations about maybe selling. And we'd also heard that they don't have the authority to sign contracts right now. And then all of a sudden this pops up and they really went gung ho on social media. The Coyotes social media team uh, posted a whole bunch of the renderings and it's been really hyping this up, which I understand in a way, but in the same time, like if this fails, it's, it's going to be an epic failure. Uh, but they have confirmed an interview with, their uh, but their team president that um, if this auction does not work out and it fails that they're going to have to it's a last ditch effort and relocation will definitely be taking place. So all in all, it's very positive news. It looks like things will likely work out, but there's still uh, some skepticism from some, and I think that's understandable considering everything we've seen this team go through. It's almost one of those cases where until they get shovels in the ground and they start building this thing. There's going to be doubters, and I have no doubt there will be. Um, Like I said, it's hard to have faith in them when you've seen so many uh, attempts not work out in the past. But this was real good positive news. If there is other bidders, they have control of the bid, but it could create a scenario where they may have to greatly overpay. I'm not sure if they can and want to do that, and that could change things. So theoretically, you know, they should be okay. Time will tell. June 27th, though, is the big date to keep on your calendar. As I mentioned, we have several other updates of roster moves and injury updates around the NHL. Uh, The Dallas Stars today recalled for Maverick Bork, and we did hear from Coach Peter DeBoer that he's definitely going to play. Uh, Not sure who's going to come out of the lineup, uh, but Bork will likely be in. Uh, The Seattle Kraken today recalled defenseman Kale Fleury. Uh, The Blue Jackets confirmed that defenseman Jake Bean is done for the year. He now has a broken hand. So his season is over. Uh, The Ducks have recalled Nikita Nestorenko. The Ottawa Senators returned defenseman Tyler Clevin back to the American Hockey League. So that tells us that uh, alternate captain Thomas Shabbat would be likely expected to return to the lineup. Uh, they were aiming with a strong possibility of him being able to play this weekend. So that tells us that uh, that will likely be happening. Washington once again recalled Matthew Phillips. He's been up and down a lot lately. And the uh, Carolina Hurricanes tonight confirmed that Evgeny Svechnikov is missing tonight's action because of being sick. So he's uh, under the weather for tonight. Hopefully he won't be out for too long. It seems like there's been a lot of people, a lot of players in the NHL um, missing time because of uh, illness. So must be a lot of flu bugs going around various locker rooms. Now, as I mentioned, we have in the rumor mill section some teams I want to focus on, including those Canes, Pens, and Sens. And in the terms of Carolina, we talked about before how we could see some significant change in a sense that the team has a lot of expired contracts. They can't likely keep everybody. Uh, they have two of their top four defensemen with Brady Shea and uh, Brett Pesci, both up for contract renewal, and they're likely not going to be able to keep both. So that that's going to be you know something that's going to be challenging for them. You got Seth Jarvis and Jake Gensel, both need new deals. Um, they're both going to be expensive. And the belief is they would like to keep both, which is why Marty Natchez, who also needs a new deal as an RFA, is expected that he might be the odd guy out that they might have to move. And another player that they could move or move on from to free up some salary cap space is definitely Jesperi Konkaniemi. There's no doubt, based on what we've seen and heard around this player in his season here, um, that... The Canes, I think, would be quite happy to move on from that contract. That offer sheet situation has completely backfired. Yes, they were successful. Yes, they got the the player. Yes, Montreal got compensation. And you know what? What they did with that compensation hasn't worked out the greatest for them either. But at this point, yes, Barry Kanakaniemi, after doing that crazy one-year deal, did sign an eight-year extension at uh, four point eight million and change, and it's really hasn't been a great turnout. I mean, he's putting up twenty some points a season, uh, play mostly on the fourth line. The deeper this team gets, the further he comes out, and he might not even be in the starting lineup um, in the opening lineup to start the playoffs. He could be a healthy scratch for game one. 
and you're paying him almost five million bucks, and he's on a long-term deal. I mean, that's not really an ideal scenario. I would suspect they'll attempt to trade him, but you know, even if they retain some salary, is that going to be possible? It might be. He's still young, though. Here's the thing: a buyout is a real possibility for them if they can't trade him. Because if they can trade him with retained money, they won't save quite as much in the first few years, but they won't be tied to the contract for as long because he's still in the RFA years of the deal, which means it would be a one-third buyout instead of a two-third buyout. So it'd be a lot cheaper, uh, just like the Ottawa Senators did with Colin White. He was on a six-year deal, and he had, I think four years left i believe it was and in one in in their case i believe in the second year after the buyout so it'll be like next year instead of having a cap hit they actually end up with a cap credit uh, it depends on how the contract is structured and in the case of conk and Niemi, uh they would save about four million bucks a year and then after that it would be a breeze they would obviously have this contract on their cap for an extended period of time given the number of years left on it because it is a, it'd be a one-third buyout at twice the period of time they would save a ton of money uh, i'll show you a snapshot here of how it actually works like they would probably be crazy not to do this uh even if you retain 50 percent their cap hit is still going to be significantly higher it'd be a great way for them to free up some money if that way they maybe they don't have to trade Natchez. Maybe Natchez and Jarvis can both stay. Or maybe Shea and Pesci can both stay. Either way, they've got, like I said, three really important forwards, two really important defensemen, and they're not the only ones. There's also Chatfield, and there's a couple other players as well that need new contracts. And yes, the cap's going to go up a bit, but when you have that many players that are going to be needing big money raises, it's really difficult and challenging to keep them home. So, Cock and Niemi, I do believe, will be um, have a really high probability of not being a hurricane beyond the current season. I would suspect they'll talk about trades, but a buyout is probably a much more realistic option. So we'll see. I know in Pittsburgh, I want to take a look at them as well. There was some talk about uh, Tristan Jerry, the goaltender on dailyfaceoff.com. I know the uh, uh, Frank Sarah Valley analyzed the situation there, saying that you know, is Tristan Jerry kind of played his way into a trade. Uh, Tristan Jerry, of course, signed a new longer-term deal with Kyle Dubas and the Penguins this past offseason. He was a UFA. A lot of people thought he wouldn't be back. Between his inconsistent play and his injury history, you know, most people had the expectation that the Penguins were going to likely move on, dip into the UFA market to try to find another goaltender. Well, they did do that as well. They brought in Alex Nedeljkovic. Uh, Nedeljkovic has been a great find for them. And he's actually outplayed Jerry here as of late. I mean, I suspect the Penguins are going to be busy. They're obviously not going to be, you know, super thrilled with their season. Right now, they're putting on a late season charge for the playoffs. They still have a chance to get in. Even if they do get in, making any you know, real progress or doing damage is going to be a real, real challenge for them. And it could result in a first round loss. We'll have to wait and see how everything finishes for them. But as we stand now, if they either miss or if they have a first round loss, I still think we're going to see a significant change or two around this team. They, they can't bring back the same team and expect different results. It's no different than the Senators we're going to talk about next. Like That's the definition of insanity is when you do the same thing over and over again, but you expect a different result. Like you got to try something new. And in the goaltending, Nadelkovich has outplayed Jerry here as of late. Overall in the season, Tristan Jerry has a 2.9 goals against and a 9.03 save percentage, whereas Nadelkovich has a 2.78 goals against and a 9.08 eight save percentage so he's not outplaying them really all season but it's been his more recent play that i've really pushed him ahead as being a little bit more of the you know kind of taking that starting role so to speak play more of the important games um, but jerry did sign a longer term deal where nadalkovich only signed for uh for a year so clearly you know they have a short-term goalie contract and a long-term goalie contract. The short-term one's working out way better. Trading Jerry would be very challenging, I think, at this point. The money's not huge, but there's still a significant amount of term. I don't know that they're going to be able to do that. It's going to be very, very tricky to do, but I think it's something that Kyle Dubas is definitely going to have to look at amongst other things on this team. Uh, they certainly have an opportunity here that if they do make the playoffs, I suspect, and I wouldn't be shocked, if Nedeljkovic is your starting goaltender in Game 1 if they manage to squeeze in. Otherwise, I don't know. The, the future certainly still looks 
a little cloudy and unpredictable here for Tristan Jerry. I wonder what Kyle Dubas will do in that scenario. And Daily Faceoff also talked about the Ottawa Senators today on the on the show that's live streamed at noon, uh, Daily Faceoff Live. And Sarah Valley says that not only is this next coaching hire extremely critical, and he also questioned the idea of bringing in Jacques Martin as a, you know, temporary solution he you know kind of points to the fact that the vancouver connects last year hired rick talkett rick talkett came in had a strong finish with the team get the chance to know the team the players to know him so that they could kind of have that adjustment period already in place so when they came into training camp they could hit the ground running the players knew what to expect from that coach the coach knew the players well enough that they could really you know make bigger strides in camp instead of learning a new system and getting to know each other. And a lot of those things that take time. It just, that's just the way life is. There's just, you know, some things can't be rushed and that's one of them. Um, so, you know, ultimately though, I do feel that some of the candidates that they really wanted to hire were not available at the time, but really, if you take a look at the fact that there's some real good experienced coaches on the market, whether it be Jay Woodcroft or Craig Berube or, um, you know, you get Lindy Ruff was recently let go, um, and there's others too. You know, Tom McClellan's out there. There's lots of great experienced coaches that have been linked to at least talking to the Senators. I don't know. I mean, it makes me think that whoever they want is not available yet, which is the main reason they're doing it. But we'll see if that kind of, you know, might be... We'll see if that backfires on them or not. Jacques Martin has done some good things, but we haven't seen the progress that we really thought we would, given all the structure that he normally has brought before. And it's not that he's not bringing it. I just don't know that they're fully responding to him. And Sarah Valley says that he also expects besides that, you know, besides Chickering getting all the attention in the trade mill, that he would not be one bit surprised if one, at least one core member is traded. He's like, you know, this team has not succeeded. Um, he would not be one bit surprised based on what he's heard in the trade rumors that at least one player could get moved but he's he does anticipate change what exactly that is hard to say i don't think brady is going anywhere i don't think timmy stutzler or drake batherson is going anywhere you know there's lots of talk right now that they're trying to get shane pinto signed to a long-term deal or at least a bridge deal or a new contract period because he's an rfa um pinto is very interested in going to the world championships with team usa Typically, you don't see guys do that with no contracts because there's a lot of risk involved. What if he gets hurt? That could be a big factor in his next deal. So clearly, he wants to get a contract signed first. Um, you know, and he's he's played extremely well since he came back from that 41 game suspension. So I would suspect that Pinto is a big piece of the future. Josh Norris is going to be a big question mark here yet again. Do they attack maybe that middle part of the lineup? Try to add some more spark. I mean, you know, Kubalik likely doesn't return. Joseph's had an up and down kind of season for the most part. It's been pretty good. You know, guys like Ridley Gregg have had good season, but the fourth line was really good there for a stretch. The goaltending, though, is they had a good stretch and they were winning. They won five in a row because they were getting good goaltending. Last night, they got spanked by the Panthers, six nothing. And Jonas Corpusalo let in probably the worst goal of the season from the goal line. I, I don't understand this guy. He can be so amazing one night and so pathetic the next. It is so crazy how their goaltending has completely failed them. Uh, they've had the most amount of times getting subpar goaltending in the NHL all season. They have the most, the highest number of games with a uh, save percentage, like under 890. Like it's that common. Uh, which is unfortunate, you know, and I think it shows in the team in front of them. Um, they they tend to lose confidence quick if they get behind. Like, I know I missed the first two minutes of the game. Last night I turned the TV on. Um, I wasn't sure if they had actually dropped the puck and started to play yet. It was two minutes into the game and it was already 2-0 Florida. I mean, this team, I think it's like, oh, it's over 20 times, I think, around this year that they've allowed either the first or second shot to go in. And you just can't do that. You're chasing the game too much. It completely deflates the bench. Like the goaltending here needs work as well. So whether it's Corpus Salo, whether it's Chikrin, whether it's you know another core member of that four group, you know we do expect more change. I think a lot of people were feeling a little bit too optimistic during that five game winning streak. Whereas last night against Florida, this team showed their true colors again. And like I said, Sarah Valley's convinced that something significant is going to happen based on the fact that Steve Steos has been relatively quiet here so far. They, they can't bring this back next year and not try something significantly different. They just, they absolutely have to. 
And what's that going to be? Who in next core do you think gets moved? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. We'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with the latest news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.